Hello, welcome to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. I'm Juliet the Daughter. And I'm Kevin the Dad. And this week we are talking about the definitive Bing Crosby. So, Dad, what do we need to know? Well, we need to know that this is going to be a very short bio as we have 22 songs to get through on one CD. If you want to deep dive into his life, author Gary Giddens has two volumes out so far. Um, the first covers the years 1903 to 1940, and the second just from 1940 to 1946. Giddens is working on the next volume. It was 18 years between those first two volumes, so hopefully he... Speeds it up. Speeds it up a little, yeah. yeah. Uh, plus there's Bing's semi-reliable autobiography, Call Me Lucky. Hmm. Now, Harry Lillis Crosby was born May 3rd, 1903 in Tacoma, Washington, in the house his father built. He was the fourth of seven kids. He got the nickname Bingo around 1910 from a comic feature in a local paper that Harry liked. It got shortened to Bing. Mm -hmm. Luckily, this did not translate over into Ringo Starr being shortened to Ring because that would just not work. No, anyway, it wouldn't ring as well. Get it. <laughs> anyway. anyway, he graduated Gonzaga High School in 1920 and went to Gonzaga University for three years. He didn't get a degree at the, at the time, but he did get an honorary one in 1937. That's nice. In 1923, Bing was invited to join a band made up of high schoolers, including brothers Al and Miles Rinker, whose sister was jazz singer Mildred Bailey. They disbanded in 1925. But Bing and Al went to California to seek fortune and fame. They put in 13 weeks in a review called The Syncopation Idea and honed their skills. They were spotted by a member of Banley, the Paul Whiteman's organization, and started making bank at $150 a week in 1926 as a break act between Paul Whiteman's sets. Bing always made it a point to cre credit Mildred Bailey for getting him into show business. At one point, Whiteman was thinking of letting Bing and Al go, but piano, pianist Harry Barris was added to the act. Now they were the Rhythm Boys. Hmm. Bing performed and recorded with the boys, but was starting to become in demand as a solo singer. He married Dixie Lee in September of 1930. They almost divorced, but stayed married until Lee's death in 1952 from cancer. Wow. They had four sons. In 1957, he married Catherine Grant, who had to convert to Catholicism first before they could get married. Oh. Uh, they had three children, the most famous being Mary Frances, who, as Kristen Shepard, shot J.R. Ewing on Dallas. No way! Wow, okay. Yep. And, yes, Denise Crosby from Star Trek Next Gen is his granddaughter. Yep. Uh, Bing signed his first movie contract in 1931. Over his career, he made 80 movies. Wow. 55 of which he got top billing. Oh, okay. He'd won a Best Actor Oscar in 1945 for his role as Father O'Malley in Going My Way. And he'd also make a boatload of Road 2 movies with pal Bob Hope and Dorothy Lamar. Oh, yeah. He also sang 14 songs that were nominated for Best Song Oscars. Any of them win? Four of them won. Sweet Leilani, mm -hmm. White Christmas, mm -hmm. Swinging on a Star, and In the Cool, Cool, Cool of the Evening. Mm -hmm. Oh, and he's also on the Hollywood Walk of Fame three times for radio, recording, and motion picture. No brainer. Yep. During World War II, Bing made live appearances before the U.S. troops in Europe. He also read propaganda broadcasts in German intended for German forces, which caused him to become known as Der Bengel. <laughs> At the end of World War II, Bing topped the list as the person who'd done the most for GI morale, beating out FDR, Eisenhower, and his pal, Bob, Bob Hope. Hope. I was wondering about that. Yep. Bing also pioneered pre-recording his radio show rather than doing it live, and was responsible for the tape recorder revolution in the 1950s. He also owned TV stations, racehorses, and a 25% share of the Pittsburgh Pirates' ownership. Oh my god, he must have made a lot of money. Uh, they won World Series in 1960 and 1971 whilst Bing was a co-owner. Nice. <clears throat> As for singing, Bing pretty much invented the crooning style. He wasn't a belter like Al Jolson who had to reach the back seats without a microphone. Mm -hmm. Bing ended up recording about 2,000 songs over his career. The most popular being, of course, White Christmas, which would eventually total sales of 50 million copies, making it the best-selling single of all time. Mm -hmm. Elton's remake of Candle in the Wind would be number two. I gotcha. 
It's played every Christmas season, obviously, along with the little drummer boy slash Peace on Earth medley he sang with David Bowie on his last Christmas special, which was aired posthumously at the end of November 1977, a month after Bing had died from a massive heart attack after playing a swell round of golf on a course in Spain. He's probably still making money off of those Christmas songs, even though he's dead. And then in 1983, six years after his death... What? Trablish. What do you mean, Trablish after his death? Normally, the Trablish happens when they're alive. Well, this is our first ever posthumous Trablish. This is this is a first, folks. <laughs> Oldest son, Gary Crosby, oh, came no. up with a memoir called Going My Own Way, okay. which painted the portrait of Bing as a strict disciplinarian. Like, really strict. Did any of his... Like, to the point of abuse. Did any but of his siblings, abuse siblings begged to differ, saying Bing was strict, but they didn't think it was to the point of abuse. So I guess it's all on your point of view. So he's trying to make money but, off a dead dad. But even Gary wound up backpedaling a little bit. Uh-huh. And obviously Bing was not available for comment. Yeah. Yeah. Convenient. Yep. So as for me, when I was a kid, of course, I knew Bing from his Minute Maid orange juice commercials. I've seen those, yeah. They played them a lot. And from hearing, of course, White Christmas Every Christmas. When I got Rhino's Sentimental Journey box set back in the 90s, it introduced me to my favorite Bing song, Far Away Places, which inexplicably is not on this collection. But it's a very good song. Yes. Um, I got the disc we're, review- we're going to be reviewing from Savers earlier in the year for, I think, a buck. It's called the Definitive Collection, but even the liner notes admit that's, that it's impossible. What would his output? Mm-hmm. If anything, the bulk of the songs on here are his gold records from the 1930s to the 1950s. And this set came out in 2006. Okay. Ready? Yep. Let's go. First track, Where the Blue of the Night Meets the Gold of the Day. This is already higher for Bing than I'm used to. When he hits the lower notes, it sounds like him to me, but his voice is not unpleasant. Reading the comments gave me some context about how this reflected a lot of longing of people who left home during the Depression to find work. I'm sure this made tons of people cry when they first heard it on the radio. The mood of this song is very wistful, and Bing singing in his higher voice works here because he sounds like he might burst into tears at any moment. If this is the song where Bing makes his great debut, the emotion of the song would stay with you a while, and you'd be constantly trying to remember the singer who made you feel that way. Also, shout out to Bing or whoever it was that was whistling. It sounded a lot like a bluebird from Snow White, and if this song inspired the nature sounds of Disney movies, I wouldn't be surprised. I think it might be him. Okay. This was recorded in November of 1931, and Bing actually co-wrote this with Roy Turk and Fred Alhart. It went on to become the theme for Bing's radio show. And, yeah, it sounds like Bing had someone and then lost her, and he lives in dreams for the days he used to know. I can definitely see the depression connections, though. Mm -hmm. At the time when night is ending and day begins, that's possibly the dream state Bing is in. She waits for him. Mm -hmm. It's a sad song, but then he starts whistling like, "Eh, it's no big deal. Things will be fine. Mm -hmm. I think, oh, Bing, you're just fooling yourself. (laughs) And, yeah, as for that voice, it's just so young sounding here. And I, th- I, he just hasn't approached the Bing voice that we're accustomed to. But you can tell he's almost there. He's getting there. Yeah. yeah, he's getting there. And he's not shouting like Al Jolson, but he's not flat out crooning yet. No, he's getting there, though. Next track, Stardust. There is one version of this I absolutely love, and it's not this one. The passion <clears throat> in Bing's voice is fine, but the musical arrangement is not right. The key sounds almost too cheery, like insert generic 30s song here. And the tempo is rushing it too much. The best version of this one is Nat King Cole's, which I first heard in the opening credits of My Favorite Year. There's much more sorrow in that, but you feel the embers of love in Nat's voice. And every time I see a beautiful sunrise, I put Nat's version on and sway to it while looking at the sky. The orchestra in that version with the strings has a lushness that's missing. The music conveys the love didn't end bitterly. It just passed, but Nat remembers. And even with his aching heart, he looks back fondly. As for Willie Nelson, that guitar has a perfect melancholy in the vein of Stairway to Heaven. And there's an intimacy like when you're up in bed and sleeping alone. Basically, those two versions are great and they found the balance of emotion, whereas Bing's is going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. This was written by Mitchell Paris and Hoagy Carmichael in 1927. It's an American standard that's been recorded over 1,500 times. Mm -hmm. Bing's version was recorded in August 1931. And I thought that it seemed to be repeating the formula of where the blue of the night meets the gold of the day, mm-hmm. similar subject matter, 
you got the whistling, and it's like a little too cheery. Yeah, it's too cheery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, the, especially those first two verses are just a little too jaunty for yeah. the subject matter. And now the purple dusk of twilight time, that's not happy. Yeah. That's, that's reminiscing. But after those two verses, yeah. Yeah. Um, Bing starts to settle down a little bit. But again, it's 1931, and I think he's still learning. Yeah. And yeah, for a stellar, stellar performance, yep, check out Willie Nelson's version from the album of the same name. It came out in 1978, and it stayed on the Billboard 200 Albums charts for two years. Wow. But it stayed on the Country Album charts for 10 years. And I think it deserves as it. As for the Nat King Cole version, yeah, he, he definitely gets it right. He, yes, thank you. Yes. yes. He definitely does. Next track, Blue Hawaii. Here we go. That's the signature Bing sound. This sound makes you sway like the ebb and flow of the waves. Something tells me you played this on your honeymoon. The background vocalists aren't too much, and the guitar and ukulele sound like Hawaiian music. However, I think my generation can't help but hear that style of ukulele and think of SpongeBob. Ah, uh, bikini bottom. But his voice is getting better as we go. As for Elvis... Oh, man, I love the musical arrangement they did for his version. Sounds beautiful. Doesn't look too happy on that album cover, though. He does not. I hope we're not mm. running into a trend where I like the covers of Bing's songs better than Bing himself, because then I'm going to want to keep apologizing to a dead guy. Will I download Elvis's version, though? I don't know yet. We shall see, because I just listened to that song after seeing the Priscilla movie. <laughs> so my version, my vision of Elvis was altered a little bit, so I got I to gotta think. Uh-huh. This was written in 1937 by Leo Robin and Ralph Ranger, for the movie, Wacky Key Wedding. Why, you mean Waikiki? That too. <laughs> or could be Wacky Wacky Key Wedding. Okay. Starring Bing. And yes, this is the song Elvis recorded in 1961 for the movie he was in of the same name. Mm -hmm. Bing is backed by steel guitarist Lanny McIntyre and his Hawaiians. And yes, Lanny and the Hawaiians did really come from Hawaii. Huh. Um, Bing's voice has improved a lot in the six-year leap from Stardust to Blue Hawaii. No whistling, and he identifies with the material. Mm -hmm. His voice is absolutely smooth and relaxed. Lanny and the Hawaiians provide tasteful background harmonies, and the song has a dreamlike quality to it. Mm -hmm. I did listen to Elvis's version a couple of times mm -hmm. in no contest. I like Bing's better. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the, th here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Elvis's version comes across as corny, but it's not his fault, though. His voice is perfect. It is. It's so perfect for the song. It's the arrangement and the background vocals. I think Elvis deserved better because I think that arrangement is kind of like stereotypical Hawaiian music, if that makes sense. I think they could have done more. They give him better with Can't Help Falling in Love With You. That's true. They do. I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you there. Next track, Pennies From Heaven. So Wouldn't that hurt? Yeah, depending on the speed that they're coming down. So I already knew Louis Prima's version just by growing up with you, but everyone in my generation knows Louis' version from Elf in the scene where Buddy explores New York City for the first time, which, fun fact, Elf is being re-released in theaters this year for its 20th anniversary. Elf's soundtrack is also one of the best, in my opinion. John Favreau knew what he was doing. Anyway, as for Bing, I heard that opening and wondered, what the heck is this? This is certainly a different take, and these intro lyrics are something else. His voice does sound heavenly. He makes it feel like a lullaby for kids, something you tell them about why it rains the way it does, like how mom used to tell me thunder and lightning were the angels bowling in heaven. I think it makes the song more meaningful as a comfort song. It's very sentimental, and I don't mind it. But then you put Louis on, and it's just fun. This one has the same fast tempo you'd find a singing in the rain, and you can't help but be in a good mood. Then mm. Sam kicks in with the sax, and you just sit there and marvel. I'm sure Bing thought this was a bastardization, but I love it. Hello, Louis. Bing, you're a bastard. <laughs> uh, this was written in 1936 by Arthur Johnson and Johnny Burke. Bing recorded it for the movie of the same name. Oh. And it's been recorded a lot, and yes, now you, you kids know it from Elf and Louis Prima's version, which is just outstanding. It's not a bad reason to know it, either. No. And I think this song seems to be an allegory about the Depression. Like, Bing sing, sings the intro about how a long time ago, things used to be great. Uh-oh. But nobody appreciated them. So someone decided it was planned that they would vanish now. Mm -hmm. And you must pay to get them back again. Mm -hmm. That's what storms are made for. Mm -hmm. 
okay. which the country is kind of going through this like really, really lousy period. But don't worry. When it rains, it rains pennies from heaven. And people actually bought into this. Huh. But not everyone, I bet. Because <laughs> it took World War II to really end the Depression. Mm-hmm. Anyway, like Blue Hawaii, pennies has a dreamlike quality to it, which makes sense because reality was the Depression and... Mm-hmm. You know, people would just go to these movies and see like these Busby Berkeley musicals where like to you've escape, got hundreds yeah. of people dancing and hey, everything is great, depression, come on. And then you go outside and, and back to stupid reality. Like, oh my God, everything's in black and white. All the colors are gone. Yeah. Yeah. But I think Bing really wanted his listeners to believe that good times were coming eventually. Mm-hmm. And then Louie came in and blew it out of the water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Next track, Sweet Leilani. I first heard about this song from Olivia Harrison. She said George would put this on when there was a full moon and give her a gardenia. Fellas, step up your game. So I went into this thinking... Yeah, but he could also play the ukulele. Yeah, that's true. Mm. So I went into this thinking it was going to be the most romantic song in the world. And for me, Bing should not be singing in his higher register. Because at one point when he sings the vowels, he almost sounds like a southern hick, especially when he sings the title. Then he finally sits in his natural vocal range, and it sounds so much better. If he sang like that the whole time, this song would be better overall. And we also don't need that operatic singer who makes it a duet. She sounds fine, but blends better with the other backup singers. Bing, you're not a tenor. Be a baritone. Uh, This is written by Harry Owens, also for the movie Waikiki Wedding. Mm -hmm. It won the Oscar for Best Original Song, beating out. George and Ira Gershwin's They Can't Take That Away From Me. You're kidding. Oh, come on. Once again, the Academy gets it wrong. Yep. Uh, Leilani is Hawaiian for Heavenly Garland of Flowers. And fun fact, your mom said if we ever had another baby and it was a girl, she would have wanted to name her Leilani. Really? Oh, okay. Really. Okay. It's Lanny and his, McIntyre and his Hawaiians backing up Bing again. And... I thought I didn't think that was Bing singing on the first two verses. I thought okay, it might so have been. Okay, so it's not him. I thought it might have been Lanny I or one of the other band members. I don't like it though. I think. I think because that's almost kind of like the Hawaiian style people are used to hearing, like a, like a higher. Tenor voice. Tenor voice, yeah. Yeah. And but then Bing himself comes in on the third verse. It's and, like, where have you been? Oh, he does that a lot as we go along. Um, yeah. This song is okay, but, you know, again, God in heaven, how did this win over They Can't Take That Away From Me? Yeah, that's bull. I just cannot figure that out. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's like Randy Newman not winning the Oscar for um, You Got a Friend in Me. Or uh, When She Loved Me. Yeah, as opposed to some song that nobody can remember from Monsters, Inc. Exactly. Anyway... Next track, You Must Have Been a Beautiful Baby. The first time I heard this was like a short tongue-in-cheek version when Carol Burnett was getting honored at the Kennedy Center and Gary Beach came out and sang this in the Mrs. Hoygans costume. But as for the song itself, it's quite cute. Bing is complimenting his girl saying, You must have been a beautiful baby, because baby, look at you now. This was way before the age of Neville Longbottoming, so it could have easily been the opposite. You remember that kid who played Neville Longbottom yeah. and he grew up to be like, like, a, like a hunk? So maybe it's also the case of, like, this kid could, like, look kind of rough and goes through puberty and comes out like a total, like, model. Okay. So it could have been the opposite. What makes this even more sweet is that Bing wants everyone else in this girl's life to appreciate her beauty, too, which is quite lovely. And this is also the first song that comes in crystal clear, which I think indicates, one, Bing's finally made it, and two, recording equipment got a lot better over the years. As for Bobby Darren, his feels more 50s rock. I like the opening, but he feels more sleazy and more bad boy, and I prefer the Charm of the Bing version. Call the police. Yes. I oh, just, so it's this one right here. The guy is just swinging a little too hard. Yeah. Uh, this is written in 1938 by Harry Warren and Johnny Mercer for the movie Hard to Get. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bing came out with his version in October of 38, and it went on to be the biggest selling version of the song. It's been recorded a lot. Um, I do have Bobby Darren's version. Um, and I'm more familiar with that one. And for some reason, this song was used a lot in Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies cartoons. Really? I don't know why, but it just was. Huh. As for the song, it's self-explanatory. Yeah, she must have been a cutie patootie as a kid, because look at her now. Yowza. Uh, Bing and his brother Bob Crosby and his orchestra keep things lively. Mm-hmm. And this is the first big band number that we come across on the collection. Mm-hmm. 
Next track, Home on the Range. The first time I heard this was when Mr. Bergstrom sang this to Lisa's class and Lisa's substitute. Mm -hmm. This song is a romantic version of the American West, but I know that this is mom's personal hell. But you know Bing performs this well when he makes you nostalgic for a place you've never been to before in your life. The most beautiful lyric is, How often at night... Where the heavens are bright with the light of the glittering stars, have I stood there amazed and asked as I gazed if their glory exceeds that of ours. A very romantic song. This was written in either 1872 or 73 by Daniel Kelly and Brewster Hiley. It became Kansas's official state song in 1947, as opposed to Carry On Wayward Son. Mm -hmm. uh, Bing first recorded it in 1933, then again in 1938, and then again in 1939, which is the version on this collection. And yeah, this is a great version. He really makes you wish that you had a home on the range. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's his phrasing on the chorus that really makes it stand out. Mm -hmm. um, listening to him sing like this, he makes you want to have that home too, along with the playing deer and the antelope. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can hire someone to clean up after them. <laughs> Next track, White Christmas. <clears throat> so the Drifters cover is my favorite version, but Bing's is the standard. The blueprint that all covers of this song will be compared to. So it makes sense why the Drifters did something completely different. Now, if you go on the Bing Crosby YouTube channel, in the animated music video, they go back to the context of this song as it was originally written. It came out in 1942, so this was kind of in the same vein as I'll Be Home for Christmas, where everyone overseas is missing their family and desperately wanting to be home. And boy, did that animated video make me tear up. I'm not sure why they gave Bing black hair instead of brown, but whatever. Iconic song. What else can I say? Mm -hmm. This was written by nice Jewish boy Irving Berlin for the 1942 movie Holiday Inn. A lot of Christmas songs were written by nice Jewish boys. They were, yeah. Hey, gotta make money. They knew the holiday better than, uh, than us Gentiles. Well, it's in the zeitgeist, so mm. can't really escape it. Mm. It won the Oscar for Best Original Song in 1943. Well, they got can't that argue one with right. that. Yep. It was number one for 11 weeks. Bing re-recorded it in 1947 after the 1942 master was damaged due to frequent use. Oh, but apparently sound restoration has improved over the decades because that original 1942 version is the one that's on this collection. Mm -hmm. And it sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, another version for the 1954 movie, White Christmas. Yes. But the 47 is the, is the standard. Yeah, this um, one we all know. Yeah. And yes, it's been recorded a lot over yep. the decades. Uh -huh. But Bing's is the definitive version. And the Drifters is the funnest and the coolest. And everyone seems to leave off that intro about um, um, the palm trees, the orange and palm trees sway. There's never been a day in old L.A. The oh, Darlene Love version, that's right. you get that intro. That's right. That's right. I forgot about everyone that. Everyone forgets about that. Yeah. CRFL Spectre episode <clears throat> for the context on that one. Yep. Now, Bing, along with John Scott Trotter and his orchestra and the Ken Darby singers, knocked it out in 18 minutes. It's on May good. 29th, 1942. Yeah. The rest is history. And this is the one Bing song everyone knows. Oh, I mean, yeah. Everyone. Given the time White Christmas came out, yeah, you could look at it as, you know, it being sung by a GI fighting mm -hmm. in World War II. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a fun fact. John Scott Trotter went on to arrange and direct the music along with Vince Guaraldi <gasps> for every peanut special from It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Hey. To 1975's You're a Good Sport, Charlie Brown. That explains why uh, the music sounds the way it does. And then he died. Yeah, uh, and then Vince died too. Mm. Uh, next track, Sunday, Monday, or Always. This song can be summed up as dreamy. The vocalists are singing perfect harmonies at just the right volume. Bing is singing within his range and the lyrics are cute. Bing wants to know when he can see his love again. Sunday, Monday, Always? I don't like the key change they do, but that's one nitpick I have for an otherwise beautiful song. It's so nice to hear songs that are about romance without being fluffy. They're sincere and genuine, and it's lovely. Uh, this was written in 1943 by Jimmy Van Heusen and Johnny Burke. Bing recorded it with the Ken Darby singers for the film Dixie, which, of course, Bing starred in. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a musician strike at the time this was recorded, so hence, if you notice, no instruments. Mm -hmm. Basically, Bing wants this gal around Sundays, Mondays. Always. Whatever works for your schedule. Hopefully she doesn't say, how about never? Does never work for you? <laughs> um, I think the Ken Darby singers really make this song. Given that there's no instruments, they really had to. They really yeah, work it. Yeah, they're, they're the accompaniment for this one. 
Next track, Swinging on a Star. I can see this song being a great children's book because it's been giving life lessons almost in the form of a fable. If you're not motivated to excel, you might be as dumb as a mule, as lazy as a pig, or foolish like a fish. If you apply yourself, you can swing on a star. And the backup singers paired with Bing make this really charming. I added this almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also written by Jimmy Van Heusen and Johnny Burke, Bing sang it in the 1944 movie Going My Way, and it won an Oscar for Best Original Song. Yeah, I think Van Heusen got the idea whilst dining at Bing's house. Bing's son, Gary, uh -oh, said he did not want to go to school. Bing told him, if you don't want to go to school, you might grow up to be a mule. And then Bing took off his belt. No, no, that was disputed. <laughs> um, in the movie, he does sing it to a bunch of little kids who are saying, I don't want to go to school. So yeah, life lessons. I'm I would be surprised mm. if this wasn't like a kid's book already. Mm. This song's been recorded a lot, but Bing's is the definitive version. Mm -hmm. Even though for some of the song, he hardly shows up. John mm -hmm. Scott at Trotter's... Gon John Scott Trotter singers, sorry, <laughs> are doing most of the work in the pig and the fish verses. Because if you notice, he says, would you rather be a pig? And then they do all the singing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But it's not bad. And Bing just sings one line because he's Bing and he can do what he wants. And he sounds fine. He's like Sinatra before Sinatra was Sinatra. Yeah, but I think he was less of a dick than Sinatra was. True, but he was a big influence on Sinatra. That's true. And then Sinatra became an influence on him in the 50s with his concept albums because Bing decided, hey, I'm just going to record stuff that I want to do. And then there's my favorite in-joke when they're in high society where Frank says, don't dig that kind of croon and chum, and Bing goes, you must be one of the newer fellas. <laughs> <laughs> Next track, Too ra lu ra lu ra That's an Irish lullaby. Yeah, this song made me tear up. It starts off with beautiful pizzicato, plucking the strings, and then Bing's voice is so smooth and soft. His voice is robust, but without blowing you over, crooning. Mm -hmm. Bing sings this song his mom used to sing to him and what he'd give to hear her sing again. If you ever lost someone as a kid, then this song will hit home for you. Beautiful lullaby that makes me emotional. This was written in 1913 by James Joyce Shannon for the musical Shamin Du. Hmm. Okay. I guess it was big back in 1913. Chauncey Alcott recorded it that same year and it hit number one. Bing reintroduced the song to the public when he sang it in Going My Way. Father O'Malley, he was quite the singer. Uh, Bing sings Tura Lura Lura a lot as it makes up most of the song. Mm -hmm. There's just one verse in which Bing tells us his mom used to sing this back when he was a kid in Killarney and he'd give the world if he could hear, he could hear her sing it again. Now, Bing's version could put you to sleep, and I mean that in a good way, yeah, because good it way. is a lullaby after yeah, all. Yeah. But yeah, when he starts singing about his mom, yeah, it kind of gets you right here. Mm -hmm. Next track, Don't Fence Me In. I mm. was wondering if the Andrews sisters were going to show up or not. Bing wants to be in the open countryside with his horse. The music sounds great with a more pronounced drum and a honky-tonk piano, and the Andrews sisters always make me sway pleasantly. It's a good song to get you to relax. As for David Byrne's cover, the music video is pretty cool with a lot of different people lip-syncing the lyrics. As if everybody is saying, we are people, we are here, and we want our own space so we can exist. The band sounds like a military fife and drum with a Celtic fiddle, which is an interesting sound as if to indicate they are firm in their desires. Uh, this was written in 1934 by Cole Porter and Robert Fletcher. And Bing and the Andrews sisters recorded their version in 1944, and they knocked it out in half an hour. Mm. It sold more than a million copies and was number one for eight weeks. And, yeah, David Byrne did quite an excellent version in yeah. 1990 for the Red Hot and Blue Cole Porter tribute album. Now, get this. Mm -hmm. Bing recorded 53 songs with the Andrews sisters. And you can actually get, like, a CD set of every single song, plus outtakes and what well, have you. I believe you. it, yeah. Um, this was their ninth collaboration. Bing sings the first half of the song with the Andrews on backup background harmonies. Then he turns it over to them for most of the second half. And I always enjoy their team-ups. Like, I have an, yeah. an Andrews Sisters two-disc best of 50th anniversary. And... There's a lot of material on there by by them. And sometimes, I'll admit, they can be a little eye-rolling when they try to act hip with the jazz lingo of the day. Oh, no. But they're still always very enjoyable. <laughs> you're kind of like, no, no, you're, you're not black and you never will be, but you're trying. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, boy, that's American culture in a nutshell. Um, also, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, never thought I'd hear you compliment something by David Byrne that was outside of Talking Heads. Hey, he did a good job. 
next track, Road to Morocco, have not seen the movie, and I found out you haven't seen the movie either. And I never heard Bob Hope sing before now, but he's got a pleasant voice. And then I realized this is where Family Guy got We're Off on the Road to Rhode Island from. I've never seen a Bob and Bing duet, even though I knew they were a famous pair. But I think they really work because Bob brings out Bing's playfulness. And look at the fourth wall breaks. The camel joke stood the test of time, having ridden a camel, it is very weird. And I love the line, I hear this country's where they do the dance of seven veils. We'd tell you more, uh, but then we'd have the censor on our tails. Only Family Guy actually got away with saying ass by the time their parody Road to Rhode Island came out. Great to see the source, and it's a fun time, and I love the original. And I will say quickly, the first time I saw the two of them do anything together was Carol Burnett used to do this sketch where famous people would come into a, re a restaurant and she'd be the goo-goo-eyed waitress who just would not leave them alone. And so finally, Bing, she wears him down to get his autograph and she's like, never mind, someone more famous is walking in right now. And Bob Hope comes in and Bing didn't know he was going to be there. So it's kind of hilarious to see his face. I'll show you later. Huh. Yeah. Okay, this is written by Jimmy Van Houston and Johnny Burke for the 1942 movie of the same name. Mm-hmm. This this is just a flat out lock. I mean, Bing and Bob Hope they don't take it seriously at all, no. nor should they. Yeah. They even admit they're really not sure why why they're going where they're going, but they lay eight to five. They'll meet Dorothy Lamour, and even more meta. We may run into villains, but we're not afraid to roam because we read the story and we end up safe at home. <laughs> oh, like with oh, maybe that's where Mel Brooks got it from with Robin Hood Men in Tights. Wait, I miss. I'm not supposed to miss. Where's the script? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I thought the best lines were like Webster's Dictionary where we're Morocco bound and like a complete set of Shakespeare that you get in the corner drugstore for $1.98 where Morocco bound. Mm -hmm. An absolute hoot. I really hope the movie lived up to the song. The only part of the movie I've ever seen is the part where they actually sing the song in the movie and they're writing Let me Google the fake camel. The uh, Rotten Tomatoes rating. <laughs> 79% on Rotten Tomatoes, so leaning towards good. That's almost a B. Yeah. All right. So, Road to Morocco. So, the next one is It's Been a Long Time. Every no, It's Been a Long, Long Time. Long, Long Time, right. Every Rolling Stones was It's Been a Long Time, which I'm oh, that's sure right. covered from somewhere else. Anyway. anyway. Every man who came home to their woman after the war could probably identify with the son to a T. And the woman of Bing's dreams is back in his life, and all he wants to do is kiss her. And he's finally at peace now that the woman of his dreams is no longer a dream, but right in front of him. This song is also good for anyone who's in a long-distance relationship. Very sweet and romantic. Uh, this was written in 1945 by Julie Stein and Sammy Kahn. Harry James and his orchestra with vocalist Kid Kitty Callan had a hit with it first, and it went to number one in November of 1945. Bing's version with Les Paul on guitar came out the same week as James's version and replaced it at number one in December. Hmm. Brent Spiner recorded his version in 1991 for his album, Old oh, Yellow Eyes is Back. Still haven't listened to that. It's really tough to find like a physical copy, but I'm sure it's, it's out probably there on, on Spotify and YouTube. The interwebs. Yeah. Um, in Bing's version, I think this song is sung from a returning GI's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure the, um, what's a nice word? <laughs> oh, God. Co-mingling of all the soldiers coming home to their wives and loved ones. Oh, yeah, turning into rabbits. That's how the baby boomer generation came along. Mm -hmm. Yep, can all be traced back to this song. Or maybe not. Anyway, <laughs> um, for this is definitely not the big band Harry James version. This is just Bing, Les Paul on guitar, and a rhythm guitar, and the bass player. Mm -hmm. It's very low-key and intimate. Nothing else is needed. And Les Paul had said... Um, it's not how many notes you played, but what particular notes you played mm. that made the song. <laughs> he was a humble guy. So it's uh, not a fun... of too many notes. Yeah, exactly. He ain't no Mozart. And Mozart never had too many notes. Mm -mm. Anyway, fun fact, the Harry James Kitty Callan version was used in two Marvel movies, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, and Avengers Endgame. This is the song Steve Rogers dances to Aww. with Peggy Carter when he decides to go back in time and live his life with her. Side note, have you seen the memes that came out after that? Where because Steve lived in the future for so long, he knows how much stuff is going to happen. So someone developed like a fan headcanon where Steve says to Peggy, like, I guess maybe one day when they were tired and looking to invest stock, he's like, hey, Peggy, we should invest in this company called huh? Apple. Oh, why? Yeah, trust me, trust me, trust me. It's going to be great. <laughs> 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 so he's just gaming history to become like super rich good for him uh, 
Unless it's an alternate history. Mm. Mm, maybe. Anyway. Also, we don't know what if the Avengers got paid at all. I don't think they did. Mm. Next track. McNamara's Band. Bing has an Irish lilt as he sings about being a member of McNamara's Irish Band with its token Swede. They're so good, they impress General Grant, which is a pretty cool thing to hear from a Civil War hero. This song is fun, upbeat, cute, and that's really all I gotta say. Yep, this was written in 1899 by Seamus O'Connor and John J. Stanford. I don't know if Grant was alive back then. Anyway, it's a St. Patrick's Day standard, and Bing recorded his version in December of 1945, and that's what brought it back into the public. Mm -hmm. uh, Mac and his band play weddings, wakes, funerals, you name it, maybe even bar mitzvahs? Don't know. Um, corny is beef on March 17th, but if you're hammered on St. Pat's Day, does it really matter? No. No, it doesn't, but it's a fun song. Got this Irish joke that I got from this David Nile, who's an Irish comedian I listen to. He's like, talking about Irish immigration, he's like, in Ireland, we don't even have a Chinatown. We just let them live with us. <laughs> <laughs> Next track, Alexander's Ragtime Band. Okay, so the version I found was a duet with Bing Crosby and Al Jolson. Yep. And it was okay, but I wasn't blown away. McNamara's band is more Bing, and it's clear that he's just doing cover of this with a friend of his for fun. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not his style. Although it did remind me of that theme song I would hear on that VHS tape before watching Really Rosie, Come On Along and Join the Caravan, with that circle truck. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know the one. <laughs> yeah. That's all I gotta say. Okay, this was written in 1911 by Irving Berlin, and he had written lots of songs before this, uh, which reminds me of an Onion newspaper headline for our dumb century. It was, Irving Berlin writes 1,000th goddamn song. <laughs> anyway, Alexander was the one that cap catapulted Irving to fame. It's been recorded a lot. I have a version by Bessie Smith from the 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, Bing's verse version came out in 1938, and he record recorded it again in 1947, which is the version on this collection. How good is Alexander's band, you may wonder? It was so good that when they play a bugle call, it makes you want to go to war. So be careful. Mm, watch out. Bing does sing it with Al Jolson. This version isn't ragtime so much as swing. Yeah. Bing croons and Al, Al, well. He's if, Al. If Edward G. Robinson ever sang, he'd what? sound like Al. You're right. Come on. You're right. He would. Yeah. Next track, Now is the Hour, Maori Farewell Song. The original title in the Maori language mm. is Po Ataru. Bing is saying farewell as someone sails off. Could be a friend or a lover, we don't know. But it's nighttime, and by the time the dawn comes, the person they're saying farewell to will be gone. It makes you feel wistful, and the choir almost sound like the sway of the ocean breeze with how they sing. Simple and beautiful. This was written by Clement Scott, Mewa Kayaho, and Dorothy Stewart. And even then, the uh, songwriting credits have a convoluted history. If you'd like more information, go on Wikipedia. Um, in 1948, seven versions of this song were released. Bing's was the only one that hit number one. <laughs> now is the hour when we must say goodbye, but Bing will be faithfully waiting. A truly heartbreaking goodbye song. It just, it really is. Mm -hmm. Next track. Dear Hearts and Gentle People, my first note, this can't be a New England neighborhood. Bing is obviously singing about a hometown down south where all the neighbors are God-fearing, sweet, and kind. Dear Hearts and Gentle People. And so God-fearing, no. Sweet, no. Kind, no. Definitely not New England. Nope. He loves them genuinely. It's not demeaning or overly saccharine. As for Dinah, hers is definitely more Dixie. Oh, gee, I wonder why. I don't hate it. It's fine. And the clapping like we're all in church is fun. But the timbre of Bing's deep voice being loving and vulnerable is more moving to me. Bing's cover is for the holidays. Dinah's is for the bubbly summer. Uh, this was written in 1949 by Sammy Fain and Bob Hilliard. First recorded in, in September 1945 by Miss Dinah Shore. Mm -hmm. uh, Bing's version came out a month later in October. Now, Bing refers to going back to his hometown in Idaho, which I'm sure the people in Spokane, Washington must have loved. But then I thought, <laughs> there's not too many words that you can rhyme with Washington, hence no. Idaho. Yeah. Because he has to go to Idaho. Oh, no. Um, as for Miss Dinah Shore, uh -huh. I find her version to be definitive and untouchable. Okay, fine. Because she, she refers to her hometown in Tennessee, which is where she was born and raised. Yeah. And I get the feeling that she probably really lived this song when she was young. Especially down south. Yeah. Next track, play a simple melody. I think this song is Irving Berlin <clears throat> being nostalgic for old-time ragtime music, a sentiment I'm sure was echoed over the years as rock and roll came along. The version I listened to was a duet with Gary Crosby. 
there's nothing wrong with it. Just two guys having fun, and the band sounds great with the instrumental, like a ragtime band. And Gary is doing his best Louis Armstrong, prompting Bing to laugh and say, don't lose your head. It's serviceable, but I bet if Louis Armstrong did a cover, it would be way better. Oh, yeah, because Bing and Louis, they were pals. They were pretty tight. Mm -hmm. uh, this was written... In 1914 by Irving Berlin. Wow, he's been around that long. So he was complaining about music, you know, way back then. Oh my god, he was an old fart. Yeah. Like, like Gene Simmons in that documentary we watched. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, this, this version was released in 1950 under Gary Crosby and Friend. Friends sounded a lot like Bing. And I believe Bing's improvised line, Play a simple melody, son, or I'll beat you senseless, was edited out. Oh, <laughs> but... I think Gary's really trying here. He's trying really, really hard, but he just doesn't have a unique voice. I mean, it's serviceable, but, I mean, Bing, geez, you listen to him and you realize, okay, this is why Bing was big. Yeah. And I just wish it was him solo on this track. Yeah, I do too. I mean, for me, it kind of reminded me of like, you know, this is Frank Sinatra and... Frank Jr. Because I think, <laughs> boy, if my dad was Frank or Bing, the last thing I would ever do was be a crooner. Yeah. I mean, Nancy knew what to do. What to do. Yeah. yeah she I think did. she also had an advantage in the fact that, you know, she's a woman pop singer and Frank was a gentleman's crooner. So I think maybe her advantage was being born of the opposite sex. Well, I mean, she could have done something like, I mean, they were they were female crooners back in the day. That's but true. I mean, yeah, I mean, when she was born, it was mm -hmm. like, you know, rock and roll, baby. Or like when Jason Gould decided that he wanted to start singing, he was like, at first I didn't want to do it because with who my mom is, I can't even open my mouth. People are going to compare me. Oh, yeah. But people yeah, are like, tough. oh, he's fine. Yeah. Next track, In the Cool, Cool, Cool of the Evening. Who wants a barbecue? I was, I listened to this song right before going to work in the morning and I wrote, oh, God, now I'm hungry. And I just ate breakfast. This barbecue sounds absolutely amazing. Bing Crosby at this barbecue has steak, ham, and bouillabaisse. Who wouldn't love that at a barbecue? I think it's a perfect song for when families throw barbecues in the summer, and you sway to the music like you would sway to a summer breeze while dancing to music with your friends. As for Rosemary Clooney, hers is a fun cover, too, and I'm going to state an opinion. I think her voice is the woman crooner's equivalent to Bing's. Peggy Lee comes in at a close tie, but there's a timbre to Rosemary's voice that's similar to Bing's. However, I downloaded Bing's cover because the tempo is more my speed for this track. Great trumpet solo, though, too. Mm -hmm. This was written in 1951 by Hoagy Carmichael and Johnny Mercer. It was used in the movie Here Comes the Groom. Bing sings it with Jane Wyman, the first Mrs. Ronald Reagan. Oh, yeah, that's right. It won an Oscar for Best Original Song. And I'm kind of, um, I'm more partial to Rosemary Clooney's version because I've heard it a lot more. I have mm -hmm. her um, 16 greatest hits. Um, and someday, if you ever pick that, we'll delve deeper into her story. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, her career was on the downslide. Yeah. But it revived in 1977 when Bing asked her to perform with him at a show marking his 50th year in show business. And then she was back and she wound up releasing an album every single year until her death in 2002. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, that being said, Bing and Jane do a really good job with the song, especially mm -hmm. Jane. I was surprised she can sing. Mm -hmm. I like how they leave out the names, though. Like in the Rosemary Clooney version, it's Sam wants a barbecue. Sue wants a barbecue. Sam wants to boil a ham. Mm -hmm. um, Bing and Jane each take a turn with Jane singing, I want a barbecue, Bing, I want to boil a ham. It comes across as less clunky. Yeah. And like you realize, okay, they were di identifying with the song rather than, you know, it being a third person narrative. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they, say, they also sing that if any party needs freeloaders, they'll be there. Just <laughs> absolutely fun stuff. Next track, Old Man River. This version from the definitive Bing Crosby is interesting. Yes, it is. I've never heard it at this fast tempo before with a jazz arrangement. Even Rod Stewart didn't <clears throat> sing it this fast. We covered this song before in our Jeff Beck episode, and I think increasing the tempo misses the point because you don't feel the relentlessness of Old Man River. This is like a happy, bubbling brook. And I got nothing against his voice or the musicians, but this was the wrong direction to go. I'm so glad you sent me the Paul Robson version from the 1936 sh Showboat film, the original one, because that one gets me way more emotional. If you're not Paul Robson or the guy who sang it in the film remake with Ava, Ava Gardner, I think then you shouldn't be singing this at all, so shut your yap. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, this is written in 1925 by Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein II. Yes. It was used in the 1927 musical Showboat. Mm -hmm. 
Paul Whiteman and his orchestra recorded a version in 1928 with Bing on vocals, and then Whiteman recorded the second version the same year with Paul Robeson on vocals. Mm -hmm. And Paul actually went back and asked Jerome and Oscar, can you change some of the lyrics, please? And they listened. And they did. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Paul Robeson's definitive version was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2006. Deserves it. And Bing recorded it again. In 1955. Someone should have stopped him. Now, Big is backed by Buddy Cole and his, his trio. So it's guitar, bass, drums, and piano. Yes. And they do it as an upbeat jazz number, which for Old Man River... No. ...is just... It just doesn't work. I get the feeling that listening to this version, it's like... Bing is like the overseer or the foreman. He's like the big boss man. Yeah, exactly. There's there's a criteria for singing this song. Do you want to sing Old Man River? Yes. Are you black? Yes. Go ahead. Are you white? No. Stop! Yes. Because <laughs> Bing is too happy, and this song is about the hardships of black Americans. So just shut your mouth! I mean, this is just a really odd treatment of the song. It just really is. I j I'm just glad that this cover's been buried and forgotten. I hope it's been buried and forgotten. Um, Paul Robeson was alive at the time. I don't know. Ah, what his, crap. I don't know what his opinion of it was. Probably just shook his head. It's like, these <laughs> people, I swear <laughs> to God. Goddamn crackers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. All right, final track, Around the World in 80 Days. Was he in that movie, too? The, the, the 80 Days movie that everybody was in? I don't know. Everyone was in it, but it's possible. I've, I've never seen the whole thing. Okay, I thought you did. You got it on DVD once. I remember seeing... No, it was on TV. It was on TV, and I came home, and it's that ending scene where he's like, gentlemen, I am here. And then I think it's Shirley MacLaine. He's like, we've never let a woman in this club until now, and then a painting falls from the wall or something. Anyway, if this song doesn't touch you, there's no hope for you. It's just so dreamy with the strings, and Bing knows exactly what volume to keep his voice at to move you. Mm -hmm. He's been around the world to keep an appointment with the one he loves, but he's found his entire world in them. Again, Plain Simple Romance, and it's lovely to hear, immediately went on the playlist. Yep, uh, this is written in 1956 by Harold Adamson and Victor Young for the movie of the same name, which starred David Niven, Kenton Flass, Shirley MacLaine, mm -hmm. and Everyone Who Was Everyone. <gasps> That's Frank Sinatra at the piano, mm -hmm. that kind of cameo type of thing. Mm -hmm. It was only an instrumental in the film, mm -hmm. and it was when it was released as a single, Bing's vocal version was the B-side. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Bing searched the world over for his true love, and now that he found her, he sings, No more will I go all around the world, for I have found my world in you. And I think, oh, that's very romantic and very lovely, but guess what? What? I'm still going to travel the world with your mom. Ah, oh, yeah, good answer. Overall, the first half of this album uh, sort of disappointed me, but the second half got way better as it went along. If you want to listen to more crooning music, you can't go wrong with Bing, and this album has a pretty good breadth and depth of his work. Once he found his voice, he stayed there, and we're all the better for it. Great album for when you want to feel cozy, or just want to hear plain and simple romance with no strings attached that's not overly sexual or not overly lovey-dovey, but grounded in truth. Mm -hmm. So if all you know about Bing is White Christmas and the Bowie duet, and you'd like to dive more into the man and his music, this is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. And it might be all the Bing you need, because I know it's all the Bing I need. Maybe some more Andrew sisters. And faraway places. Yeah. All right. Thank you, as always, for listening to the licensed element of my dad listens to this. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. Please remember, the more you interact with the video, the greater chance we have of appearing on the YouTube homepage. If you follow me on social media, I post the episodes there. If you're friends with dad, tell him what you want to listen to, and he'll email it right to your inbox. As always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. We will be back next time with another album to nitpick and gripe about. Dad, anything you want to say before we sign off? I'm dreaming of a green Christmas. It's not just even... Like they, just like they have in old L.A. It's not even Thanksgiving yet. I know. <laughs>